Hi, in this video, Kinetic Theory of Gas, Part 2, we are going to dig into mathematical details of this molecular model of ideal gas. Specifically, we are going to drive the ideal gas law. So to set up our derivation, I'd like to consider a cubic volume like this. Let's say that a side of this cubic volume has length L. So imagine looking at this cubic volume straight along the z-axis from the positive z-axis. These are the walls of the cubic volume. Let's consider a single gas particle with some velocity v. You can express the velocity vector with x n, y, and z component. And it's going to follow some trajectory, bouncing around in this box. Now, as this gas particle bounces around, each time it bounces on a wall, it's going to exert a force. So let's try to describe that force. Specifically, this is what I want to describe. I want to describe magnitude of force perpendicular to surface. Since the motion in x, y, and z directions are independent, I think I can make this description a little bit simpler by uh, pairing up these surfaces and describing them separately. Watch. So I will treat the pair of surfaces 1 and 2 together, and the forces perpendicular to these two surfaces outward. So to describe the force, I use the basic definition of force. I hope you remember from Physics 4a that force is not defined as mass times acceleration, but force is actually defined as rate of change of momentum. So what I want to count is the total amount of outward momentum delivered on the wall by the gas divided by how much time it took. So if I'm imagining how this gas particle is bouncing back and forth, to describe the total amount of momentum delivered, I think I can do it this way. If I know how much momentum was delivered per each collision, and multiply by number of collisions divided by amount of time for that number of collisions. The amount of momentum change per collision is going to be twice mass times the x component of velocity. This is why. Imagine a particle moving towards left with some x component of velocity minus vx. So it has momentum of minus mvx going in, and after bouncing from the wall, it comes out with plus vx velocity, or the momentum of plus mvx. So the change in the momentum is the final momentum, plus mvx minus the initial momentum minus mvx, to that you get 2 mvx for the change of momentum per collision. Now for the number of collisions per time, I think it's easier to figure out the amount of time between collisions. Then it will be one collision per some amount of time we figure out. So when you take the reciprocal of the amount of time between collisions, that's going to give you this uh, fraction of number of collisions per time. So when you imagine a gas particle starting from left side, moving to the right with the speed of Vx, the amount of time it takes to the next collision when it reaches wall number two, it's going to be the distance, L, divided by the speed, Vx. So take the reciprocal of that, that's Vx over L. Okay, let's write that down. And the change of momentum per collision. 
or we can simplify this a little bit. The next two pair of surfaces we are going to handle are the pair of surfaces perpendicular to the y-axis. Surfaces 3 and 4. And all the arguments will go the same way. The only difference is where we had x component, we are going to have y component. So outward force perpendicular to the surfaces 3 and 4 are going to be, imagine going through all the arguments we did before, so where we had x, replace that with y, and the expression for force here will be 2m over l vy squared. Same distance l since it's a cubic volume. And we are going to consider surfaces 5 and 6, the two surfaces perpendicular to the z-axis. And the force for this pair of surfaces will be 2m over L Vg squared. So to calculate the pressure on these surfaces, we are going to want the total force divided by the total area. For the total force, we simply add up the terms we derived for x, y, and z axis associated surfaces and vector out 2m over L. And the total area is going to be area of one of square surfaces, L squared, times 6, since there are 6 faces. Now, we see some pretty cool simplifications. This Vx squared plus Vy squared plus Vg squared, I hope you recognize this as the magnitude of the velocity vector. So I can simply write this is v squared. And let me point out, I'm going to be combining this L. So I'm going to get L cubed. But then since we are dealing with the cube, L cubed is the volume, or capital V. Let me write all this down. Making sure you're not confusing the lowercase v for speed with uppercase V for volume. So this is for a single gas particle. Now, in usual sample of gas, there's more than a single gas particle. There's usually a large number of gas particles. So if we have an n number of gas particles, the pressure will simply scale. The forces add, so there will be n times the amount of force, so the pressure will be and times what we currently have on the right hand side. So for a sample of gas containing n particles, pressure is n times one third mv squared over volume. Now, for no particular reason, let me collect the pressure and volume on one side, erasing all of this and writing the expression here. So this is the expression we derive from basic physical principles that relate pressure and volume of a sample of gas to each other and to other quantities, the number of gas particles, and a bit of a thorny area here, the speed of gas particle, which is not that easy to measure. So at this point, let me compare this to the ideal gas law you learned in chemistry, um, except I'm going to write it in the physicist way. Pressure times volume is equal to, in chemistry you learned lowercase n times gas constant r. In physics, it would be the number of gas molecules, capital N, times what we call Boltzmann constant. K, sometimes with subscript V, sometimes without times the temperature. So this is the experimentally determined ideal gas law that relates the macroscopic dynamical quantities, pressure, volume, and temperature. Now, comparing these quantities, we notice something, that if both of these are correct, then these terms that I am putting in a box must be equal to each other. Put it in other words, 
one third mv squared is equal to Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Let me do a little bit of rewriting so that the left hand side is more recognizable. I just uh, multiplied through the previous equation by 3 halves. The left hand side is what you would recognize as the kinetic energy or more specifically the average kinetic energy. There's a little bit of details of derivation that I skipped over that I'm dealing with the average velocity. You can read about it in the book. So what this relationship is telling you is that average kinetic energy of a gas particle is given by 3 halves Boltzmann's constant times the temperature. So the temperature is directly related to the average kinetic energy of gas particles. So this is the derivation of the ideal gas law. Following the basic mechanical principles, we derived this expression here where the left-hand side was equal to the, the ideal gas law and right-hand side had the right terms but had some microscopic quantities that we couldn't directly measure. But on comparing it to the experimental ideal gas law, we extracted some information that we didn't know going in. That we have a way to get at this microscopic quantity or more specifically, the microscopic kinetic energy of gas particles. And it is directly related to the macroscopic quantity temperature. So this is pretty cool. Uh, let me show you just uh, one more thing. Let's go back to the picture of a single gas particle in a cubic volume. This gas is at some temperature, and that also means it's moving at some velocity v. And as we just talked about, there's a relationship between the temperature and this velocity by this relationship. The kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, is equal to 3 halves Boltzmann constant times the temperature. Now, from the experimental ideal gas law, PV is equal to NKT, you know that when you double the temperature while keeping the volume the same, if you do that, that leads to doubling of the pressure. That was almost uh, intuitive. That's how chemists uh, just guessed at it, and that was right. Now, how would this be consistent with the picture that we developed based on the first principles of mechanics. Now here, if you double the temperature, then temperature scales as V squared. So your speed wouldn't quite double. Instead, you lead to this result. Your speed increases by a factor of square root of 2. Hmm, but I somehow have to get to doubling of pressure. Well, let's go back to the definition of force. Force is rate of change of momentum. So what we talked about here, that does mean my change of momentum only increases by a factor of square root of 2. Because momentum is mass times velocity, so if you're velocity increase by a factor, then so does your momentum. Ah, but here's what I was almost about to leave out. Because the speed is increasing, it takes less time for the gas particles to bounce back and forth between the surfaces. So this delta T has to change as well. So it takes less time, so it's going to be reciprocal. 1 over square root of 2 of the original delta t. So all is well. If you combine this into an expression for force, force um, the, from the original value after these changes are applied, it goes to square root of 2 
divided by 1 over square root of 2, so 2 times the force. So the force on the walls are now doubled, so the pressure will be doubled. So it all checks out. So this was the derivation of ideal gas law. And although I wouldn't ask you to do derivation like this on your exams or even homework, the understanding of something like this is good to have in your, in your head as a mental background to know that what seems like new laws of thermodynamics that you are learning, they can be derived from the mechanical principles that you have learned all in Physics 4A. That's all, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.